Hi, this is the AI Storyteller. I'm Mark. The current issue is dedicated to the interpretation of a classic of French literature, Madame Bovary, by the French literary giant Gustave Flaubert from the 19th century. Let's begin with a trial that took place in 1857, on January 31st. The novel Madame Bovary was brought to trial on charges of offending public morals and blasphemy. The three defendants were the author of the novel, Gustave Flaubert, the editor of the Revue de Paris magazine, where the work was serialized, and the director of the printing house. A week later, the court ruled the defendants not guilty, acquitted them on the spot, and waived the litigation costs. Subsequently, Madame Bovary was published as a standalone edition, in two volumes, and became a bestseller in less than two months. Contemporary literary critics compared Flaubert's writing to a surgical scalpel. An artist even created a famous cartoon based on this metaphor. Gustave Flaubert stands before an operating table, holding a magnifying glass in one hand and a surgical knife with a bloody heart in the other, while a female body lies on the table behind him. This metaphor is not to be underestimated, as it reflects the prominence of medicine and physiology in the 19th century, rooted in the widespread belief in science and progress. The relationship between scholars, writers, and society was often seen as akin to a doctor-patient relationship. Society was considered ill, and scholars and writers were called upon to diagnose and treat its maladies. This concept is an important aspect of understanding the realism of 19th century literature. Analyzing society and characters as if dissecting them became a significant characteristic of Flaubert's work. However, the meaning and artistic pursuits of a landmark literary work are often not so straightforward and cannot be entirely confined to the realm of science. Let's take a closer look at Flaubert's life to understand the foundation of his creation of Madame Bovary and see who the person wielding the surgical scalpel truly was. Gustave Flaubert was born on December 12, 1821, in Rouen, a city located on the banks of the Seine River in northern France. His father was the chief surgeon at the Rouen Municipal Hospital and was highly respected in the local community. Gustave was the second child in the family, and his older brother, eight years his senior, later followed in their father's footsteps and became a doctor. In terms of the lineage of French writers, Flaubert was 38 years younger than Stendhal, 22 years younger than Balzac, and 19 years younger than Victor Hugo. He was the same age as Baudelaire, 19 years older than Zola, and 29 years older than Maupassant, who sought Flaubert as a mentor. Flaubert occupies a central position in this literary lineage, playing a role of both inheriting and influencing. In the history of modern literature, many critics also regard Flaubert as a watershed, not only because of the era he lived in but more importantly due to his pioneering significance in terms of style, a topic we will delve into later. Starting from his secondary education, Flaubert displayed a deep passion for art, always capitalizing the word art when mentioning it in his letters. He held disdain for the mundane and bourgeois individuals around him. In French, the term bourgeois refers to these people, and it also carries the meaning of the bourgeoisie or the middle class. The bourgeoisie's mediocrity and conformity disgusted Flaubert, but at the same time, they provided him with essential material for his writing. One reason for this is that, whether he liked it or not, he himself belonged to this bourgeois class. He was familiar with their speech, demeanor, and even their smell. When he said, Madame Bovary, c'est moi, he expressed a complex mixture of emotions, including strong self-irony and a hidden, almost familial attachment. Compared to his contemporary predecessor Balzac, Gustave Flaubert led a life of financial security, never worrying about his earnings. His motivation for writing stemmed from his enduring interest in the art of writing itself. Flaubert remained unmarried throughout his life, but his emotional life was far from empty. At the age of 15, during a trip, he met Madame Schlesinger, a platonic love affair that made her the object of his lifelong admiration and served as the prototype for a character in his later work, Sentimental Education. In 1846, he encountered the female writer Louise Collett at a friend's home and the two maintained a romantic relationship for eight years. Flaubert's correspondence with his friends was frequent, with a particular focus on discussing literature and art. During the last five years of his relationship with Collett, 
He was in the midst of writing Madame Bovary, and their correspondence became valuable material for the study of the novel's creation. Madame Bovary was Flaubert's first published full-length novel. Prior to this, he had only published scattered shorter works. The creation of Madame Bovary also had an element of chance. Before that, Flaubert had been working on a story set in an ancient religious context. Unexpectedly, when he shared this work with his friends, they did not hold it in high regard. Someone casually asked him, Why don't you write about Delamar? This Delamar was a former student of Flaubert's father, who led an unremarkable career and married a much older woman. Soon after, his first wife passed away, and he quickly remarried, but his second wife began to have marital troubles shortly after their wedding and engaged in two extramarital affairs, even going into debt to support her lover. Delamar's second wife passed away at the age of 28, leaving behind a young daughter, and Delamar himself died the following year. Eventually, Flaubert accepted his friend's suggestion and began writing in September 1851. Four years and seven months later, the work was completed. However, when we compare the final novel with the original story, we find that they diverge significantly. The plot, structure, and pacing of Madame Bovary are finely tuned, illustrating the powerful role of fiction in art. Some critics argue that Flaubert established modern realism in narrative, and his literary influence has become so pervasive that it often goes unnoticed. So, what accounts for the lofty literary status of this more than 300-page novel? In terms of its material, at best, it can be considered a tragic story of a female protagonist engaging in extramarital affairs, ultimately leading to her bankruptcy and suicide. It doesn't exactly exude positivity. Yet, it was closely related to a hotly debated social issue of the time. In 1816, after the Bourbon Restoration in France, the divorce laws enacted during the revolutionary period were abolished, and they were not reinstated until 1884. Additionally, France had a strong Catholic tradition. Extramarital affairs became an important, underlying aspect of the social landscape during this transitional period. Madame Bovary was written during this time, and Flaubert's choice of subject matter struck a chord with the French people. During the period when France was debating the reinstatement of divorce laws, the novelist Jules Lemaitre jokingly said that if divorce laws were passed, French literature would be finished. While this was a jest, it does reveal some historical context behind the work. The subtitle of Madame Bovary is Provincial Customs, with provincial being relative to the center of France, Paris. In the literature of that era, the concept of the provinces, presented in various ways, was intriguing. It encompassed geographical, economic, aesthetic, and emotional aspects. Many literary characters of the time either originated from the provinces and journeyed to Paris or yearned for Paris from afar. What set Emma Bovary apart from most male protagonists was that her objective conditions as a woman at the time dictated that her dreams of Paris could only be passive, limited, and even sordid or distorted. Now, let's delve into Flaubert's literary world through the text of the novel Madame Bovary. The novel is divided into three parts, with a total of 35 chapters. The story begins in a classroom at the Rouen High School, with the first sentence introducing a timid and shrinking student into the narrative. We were in class in the study hall when the headmaster walked in, followed by a new student who was not wearing the school uniform. This student, Charles Bovary, with his rustic attire and peculiar hat, steps into the story, and with him, the reader enters the world Flaubert has constructed. Keen readers will notice that the story starts from the perspective of we, which, of course, refers to Charles's classmates. Interestingly, this we disappears after five or six pages, replaced by a more detached and objective voice, using the third-person narrative. You can interpret this transition as Charles moving from the high school to medical school, thus leaving the we perspective behind. However, there are other possible interpretations, as the initial five or six pages are the only subjective narration in Madame Bovary. Gradually, readers come to learn that Charles Bovary, a young man from the countryside, has no aspirations for his life. He reluctantly entered a medical school at his mother's insistence, passed the medical qualification exam on his second attempt, and began practicing medicine in the town of Tosts. His mother then arranged a marriage for him with widow Dubuque, 
an unattractive woman but one with a small dowry. Not long after their marriage, Dr. Bovary is called to the farm for a morning visit, and it is there that he first lays eyes on Emma, the daughter of the farmer. She is a young woman in a blue woolen dress who captivates Charles's attention. It's worth noting that this Emma, the novel's protagonist, and the later Madame Bovary, is narrated by Flaubert differently than Charles himself. Flaubert shifts from the previous chronological storytelling to begin with Emma's present state, describing her from Charles's perspective, starting with her nails, hairstyle, and eyes. Then, he uses a retrospective narrative technique to trace back to Emma's previous life experiences, demonstrating Flaubert's careful consideration of narrative techniques. Dr. Bovary's frequent visits to the farm arouse jealousy in his wife, who soon dies suddenly. This is followed by Dr. Bovary's proposal to Emma and their wedding. At this point, in less than a tenth of the novel, Flaubert has Charles complete his education, marry two wives in succession, and believe he has found lasting happiness. However, the young Emma feels disappointed because she hasn't experienced the passionate love she read about in books. She quickly finds her husband, Charles, to be as dull as a sidewalk, and the happiness she expected to come with marriage remains elusive. This leaves her profoundly confused, wondering where the pleasures, passions, and ecstasy she read about in books are to be found. At this juncture, let's pause for a moment and, following Flaubert's narrative, explore how Emma's romantic notions were forged. You'll discover that reading played a significant role. Studies in social history have shown that as Europe entered the 18th century, the publishing industry flourished. With the decreasing cost of printed materials and an increasing number of literate readers, a mass readership was emerging, including women like Emma, who had some family wealth, received some education, and had leisure time. Through her reading, Emma, a housewife in a small town, becomes well-versed in the latest trends from Paris. These tidbits of information serve as a halo, illuminating Emma's dreams, suggesting to her that her small town and Paris exist within the same world. However, they also intensify Emma's inner anxiety. Married life for Emma and Charles Bovary became so dull that, in Emma's mind, it was like an attic with a skylight facing north, as monotonous as a silent spider spinning its web in the dark. The only bright spot in their lives in the town of Toast was their visit to the Marquis' estate. This particular scene is structurally significant. Flaubert intentionally embellishes the opulence and grandeur of the noble estate. But what we should note is that, although it is still narrated in the third person, it unfolds entirely through Emma's perspective. To some extent, this serves as an indirect first-person narrative from Emma's point of view. In other words, those magnificent scenes are presented to the reader, amplified through Emma's eyes, emotions, and romantic imagination. This subtle shift in perspective is a superb example of Flaubert's narrative skill. If Emma's previous notions of romantic life from books were mere glimpses through newspaper articles, her visit to the Marquis' estate was a profound lesson learned in just one night. From that point onward Emma, like her satin shoes that were stained yellow from the wax dance floor at the Marquis' ball, left indelible marks after her encounter with wealth. This experience also becomes a crucial psychological catalyst for the events that follow. Subsequently, Emma's inner turmoil leads her to develop a nervous disorder, and her husband decides to move away from Toasts after living there for four years, marking the end of the first part of the novel. The Bovaries move to Yanville, and Flaubert employs a denser narrative style. If the focus of the first part was on depicting the personal world of the Bovaries, particularly Emma, this part highlights the provincial town of Yanville, where they now reside. Yanville has only one main street, a church, a market, a priest, an innkeeper, a pharmacist, and a fabric merchant. Within this small world of characters, the Bovary couple makes their appearance. Yonville isn't much different from Toast's, except for one thing that catches Emma's attention, Leon. He is a clerk at a law firm and shares Emma's interests in art and literature. From the day they first met at a restaurant table, they engage in enthusiastic conversations about Parisian shows, novel titles, the latest quadrilles, and the social circles they are unfamiliar with. As time passes, both Emma and Leon realize they have fallen into a platonic love. However, 
Their prolonged and cautious mutual testing doesn't yield any results in their emotional game. Leon eventually loses patience and leaves for Paris, leaving behind a less happy Emma. Following Leon's departure, the next character to enter Emma's view is Rodolphe. Unlike Leon, Rodolphe is a shrewd player in the game of love. When he first met Emma, he was still maintaining a mistress from Rouen and was contemplating how to break free from her. Emma became his next target. Flaubert arranges Rodolphe's pursuit of Emma in the eighth chapter of the second part. This chapter is twice the average length of other chapters in the novel and is constructed as a famous set piece. Various characters with different roles are present at the agricultural fair. Flaubert deliberately juxtaposes the grand speeches and award ceremonies at the fair with Rodolphe's flirting and seduction of Emma, creating a multi-layered narrative. As these two narrative strands alternate, the overall rhythm shifts from leisurely to urgent, and the passion between Rodolphe and Emma continues to surge. Amidst the backdrop of an affair between a wife and another man, the actions of Charles Bovary, Emma's husband, are ironically amusing. Charles, unknowingly, actively supports Emma's liaison with Rodolphe. Charles enthusiastically endorses Rodolphe's proposal for Emma to go horseback riding, inadvertently facilitating their affair. It is during this horseback ride that Rodolphe finally conquers Emma. Gradually, Rodolphe seemed to become Emma's lifeline. She gave him gifts, asked him to think of her every night at midnight, and urged him to plan their elopement. For Rodolphe, the thrill of the affair had faded, and the words in Emma's passionate letters seemed to him like the notes of a poorly tuned instrument, capable only of amusing a trained bear. Emma was no different from the other women he had dismissed. He ended his relationship with Emma by sending her a letter with a fake tear stain. Emma fell into despair and was bedridden in for two months. After her recovery, following the pharmacist's advice, Charles took Emma to Rouen to see an opera, where they coincidentally encountered Leon. Charles decided to leave Emma in Rouen for an extra day and return to Yonville himself. At this point, readers might sense, perhaps ironically, that every one of Emma's extramarital affairs seems to be inadvertently facilitated by her husband. This is evidently a deliberate arrangement by the author, and we can explore its significance later. In the first chapter of the third part of the novel, Emma falls into Leon's hands. By this time, Leon is no longer the timid clerk he once was. His time in Paris has made him accustomed to mingling with women, turning him into another Rodolphe. Emma is no longer the goddess he looked up to. After visiting the Rouen Cathedral together, their first intimate encounter is orchestrated by Flaubert on a speeding carriage, a moment known as the fall in the carriage which has become a famous chapter in literary history. The novel meticulously records the route of the carriage's journey, almost forming a detailed Rouen guidebook. At the same time, the author describes a yellow curtain, a bare arm, and white butterfly-like scraps of paper emerging from a clover field covered in purple flowers that hint at sexual themes. Interestingly, these innuendos, which may seem tame by today's standards, were deemed scandalous at the time and the first publications of Madame Bovary had to be heavily censored. It was only after a court declared the novel innocent that Flaubert's original text was restored in later editions. To cover up her affair with Leon, Emma lied to her husband, telling him she was taking piano lessons in Rouen. She and Leon met weekly at an inn. To fill the void in her life, Emma enjoyed buying various luxury items, even running up debts with the dressmaker. Over time, her debts accumulated, and she borrowed even more money. One day, the dressmaker informed Emma that she needed to repay 8,000 francs immediately, or her property would be seized. In desperation, Emma tried to raise the money, but no one was willing to help her, including Leon and Rodolphe. In her despair, Emma obtained arsenic from the pharmacist and attempted to take her own life. After her death, Charles unintentionally discovered evidence of her extramarital affairs but forgave her. He also died of a broken heart shortly thereafter. The novel ends with a chance encounter between Charles and Rodolphe, with Charles expressing hatred towards the man his wife had once loved. Charles forgives Rodolphe, saying it was a twist of fate, but Rodolphe only despises him more. The brilliance of Madame Bovary largely stems from its analysis of the structure of societal desires, and this analysis is achieved through the portrayal of a series of typical characters. 
Let's briefly analyze a few of them. First and foremost is Madame Bovary herself. How should we understand Emma, one of the most controversial female figures in world literature? As mentioned earlier, Emma's acceptance of romantic cultural ideals comes from her reading, from the mass media, a phenomenon that was particularly characteristic of the 19th century. Compared to being controlled by her desires, Emma appears to be more controlled by her fantasies, which are based on a dual assumption of time and space. On one hand, she believes that things will get better with time, and on the other, she thinks her own world and region are always dull, monotonous, and tragic, with the vibrant Paris from the magazines as her ultimate paradise. In this sense, romanticism also implies a rejection or escapism from reality. Flaubert, who famously said, Madame Bovary, c'est moi, might as well be considered a writer with romantic sensibilities, but he sublimated his romantic impulses into the art of writing. From this perspective, compared to the one-dimensional femme fatale figures under the male gaze, Madame Bovary's character is much more multifaceted, enriched with cultural nuances. Now, let's take a look at Emma's husband, Charles Bovary. He is mediocre, slow-witted, complacent, unromantic, but he possesses a kind heart. Emma cannot forgive him even on her deathbed blaming her deteriorating fate on her initial acquaintance with this inept husband. However, Charles almost consistently responds with kindness and forgiveness, even after discovering his wife's affairs. It could be argued that, instead of being unable to discern Emma's infidelity, he is unwilling to acknowledge it. Throughout his life, trapped in his own narrow world, the stark and bloody reality was something he could not bear. From this perspective, both Emma and Charles are individuals insulated from reality. Emma is accustomed to magnifying the trivial and insignificant, while Charles, when faced with any clear context, loses his stance and everything becomes blurred. Those insulated from reality, when forced to confront the truth, only have one choice, death. Emma chose this path, and so did Charles. Lastly, let's examine a group of supporting characters, the pharmacist, the dressmaker, Leon, and Rodolphe. These four characters constitute Flaubert's fundamental judgment of the bourgeoisie class. Leon's slight interest in art doesn't differentiate him significantly from Rodolphe, and ultimately both refuse to help Emma, leading to her suicide. The pharmacist and the dressmaker represent different types of businessmen, excelling in tactics to undermine their competitors or trap their customers. Finally, Flaubert ends the novel with the ironic statement that the pharmacist recently received the cross of the Legion of Honor. The tone is highly satirical. Unlike Emma and Charles, these characters are realistic and adapt to the demands of their time. They encourage consumption and deceive the innocent. They promote romantic fantasies but remain detached from the pitfalls they create. While they didn't directly kill the Bovary couple, they all bear indirect responsibility for their tragedy. In terms of the pursuit of artistic writing, Madame Bovary serves as an exemplar. Flaubert was exceptionally devoted to finding the most fitting words to express the perfect words and sentences, striving for every sentence he wrote to perfectly reveal the essence of the depicted objects. In his letters to friends, he often mentioned phrases like I worked hard for a week, and finally left two pages. Flaubert often employs everyday objects, clothing, food, architecture, and carriages, as essential dimensions of the novel. Let's recall the peculiar hat that Charles wore at the beginning of the novel. Vladimir Nobokov associates this hat with the overly decorated wedding cake at Emma's wedding, suggesting that both symbolize the future life of the Bovary couple, dreary and mediocre. Horses or carriages also serve as thematic elements in the novel. Charles met Emma when he was called to treat a patient who had arrived on horseback. Leon suggested Emma take up horseback riding providing them an opportunity to draw closer to each other, and not to mention the famous romantic passage between Emma and Leon that takes place on a carriage. Flaubert aimed to create an effect in Madame Bovary that was different from traditional novels. His goal was to make himself, the author, disappear from the text. He sought to depict characters and their environment with precision and objectivity, creating a sense of reality akin to a scientist. To achieve this, he made numerous attempts. The sudden shifts in narrative perspective, like using free indirect speech, are one of Flaubert's creative techniques. For example, instead of writing Emma wanted to eat fruit, 
he would write a sentence like eating fruit would be wonderful, implying that the idea of eating fruit originated from Emma herself, not the author. This absence of the narrator creates an objective and detached reading experience. Compared to other novels of the 19th century, Madame Bovary focuses less on the actions of characters, with most of the activity occurring in the minds of the protagonists. While this may lead to a slower narrative pace and some discomfort for contemporary readers, one must acknowledge and admire Flaubert's ability to vividly delineate the complex inner world of a tragic female protagonist, showcasing his unparalleled mastery of the craft. Zola mentioned Madame Bovary and said that it would cause a literary revolution, using the highest praise, saying that since this novel, a new code of artistic laws has been written. In our view, Flaubert not only wrote a modern novel but also created a type of novel known as modern fiction, which significantly distinguishes itself from classical works in terms of narrative technique. To summarize today's key points. Firstly, the novel Madame Bovary faced a famous legal battle in 1857, charged with offending public morality and blasphemy, but it was ultimately acquitted, leading to its publication and becoming a bestseller. Contemporary critics liken Flaubert's writing to a surgical scalpel, a critical representation of this novel. Secondly, author Gustave Flaubert occupied a middle ground in the lineage of French writers, playing a role as a transition between eras. In the history of modern literature, many critics view Flaubert as a watershed figure, not only due to the period he lived in but also because of his groundbreaking writing style. Flaubert's personal experiences indicate his dislike and aversion to the bourgeoisie, yet they also served as essential material for his writing because, whether he liked it or not, he himself was a member of this middle-class stratum. He was familiar with their speech, manners, and even their scent. Thirdly, research in social history shows that in Europe during the 18th century, the publishing industry for books and newspapers was rapidly growing. With the decrease in the cost of printed materials and an increase in literacy rates, a mass readership was emerging, including individuals like Emma who were slightly educated, had some wealth, and had leisure time in their lives. Through reading, housewives like Emma became well-versed in the latest Parisian news and trends, which acted as a halo, illuminating Emma's dreams and intensifying her inner anxieties. Fourthly, Madame Bovary is one of the most controversial female characters in world literature. Compared to being driven by carnal desires, Emma seems to be more influenced by her fantasies, which are based on a dual assumption of time and space. On one hand, she believes that things will get better with time, and on the other, she thinks that her current world, her region, is always dull, monotonous, and pitiable. The foreign kingdom in her dreams is the paradise she longs for. In this sense, romanticism implies a rejection or escape from reality. Gustave Flaubert, who famously declared, Madame Bovary, c'est moi, might also be seen as a writer with a romantic disposition, but he channeled his romantic impulses into the art of writing. Lastly, Flaubert aimed to create an effect in Madame Bovary that was different from traditional novels. His goal was to make himself, the author, disappear from the text. He sought to depict characters and their environment with precision and objectivity, creating a sense of reality akin to a scientist. To achieve this, he made numerous attempts. The sudden shifts in narrative perspective, like using free indirect speech, are one of Flaubert's creative techniques. This absence of the narrator creates an objective and detached reading experience. Compared to other novels of the 19th century, Madame Bovary focuses less on the actions of characters, with most of the activity occurring in the minds of the protagonists. While this may lead to a slower narrative pace and some discomfort for contemporary readers, one must acknowledge and admire Flaubert's ability to vividly delineate the complex inner world of a tragic female protagonist, showcasing his unparalleled mastery of the craft. Well, that concludes the content for this episode. If you enjoyed my video, please click like, subscribe to my channel, and share it with your friends. Thank you.